Yeah, what's up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 51 of the Sailor Jerry podcast. My name is Matt Cothran. I am still your host, and today is Thursday, December 15th, 2022. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, Sailor Jerry Spiced Rum is still made the old school way. 92 proof, bold, and smooth as hell. Happy holidays, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, we are smack dab in the middle of December here. It is Christmas time. It is the end of the year. Uh, most of the world is in full holiday swing. And I just wanted to take a moment to give everybody out there... Uh, some love, some patience, some understanding in the holiday season uh, because it's a hectic time. You know, the holiday stress is real, okay? But you got to be able to make sure that you take time to just kick back a little bit and reflect and be grateful for what you got. Uh, so hello out there. Hello to the cities, as Jim Morrison would say, uh, Dallas, Texas. Let's talk about New Orleans. Let's talk about Vancouver, Canada, Toronto, Canada. Uh, you know, what about Montreal as well? Let's talk about Berlin. You know, let's talk about Paris, France. Let's talk about Manchester, England. Uh, you know, let's talk about Sydney, Australia. Let's talk about Tokyo, Japan. Uh, all around the world, much love to everybody. Things are good here. Just winding down for the year. We got one more episode after this. We're going to make it a look back at 2022 and the year that was. So I'm excited for that. But, you know, outside of that, I jumped the gun a little bit last episode. I thought I had all my Christmas shopping done. I was wrong, baby, wrong. So I'm going to keep this monologue short because your boy's got to go to the mall. It's time for episode 51. Nick Gambarian is down for life. In this episode, we catch up with the Bayside bass player and get the inside scoop on the band as they march into the year ahead. Of course, we also look back on Nick's personal journey with music and discuss the ever-changing creative landscape of the working-class musician. This is a great episode for all you lifers out there, so sit back, relax, pour yourself some Sailor Jerry, and let's go! What's up? Yo, what up, Nick? How you doing, What's going man? On, brother. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Right on, man. Well, thank you for being a guest here on yeah, the Santa Jerry podcast, my man. We are stoked to have you. Happy yeah. holidays. Happy holidays to you, man. Yeah, I got my tree up right there. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Yeah, I got mine out in the uh in the living room, man. I'm stoked. Are you a big yeah. uh Christmas guy? You like the holiday season? You know, I I do but it's been weird since i've been out here I've, I've lived in california six years at this point and uh you know last year was my first like season alone it was just like me and my dog and same thing this year but i'm still like really into it like i'm really i like putting the tree up i love you know a bunch of houses around here there's a whole street that do all lights and stuff like that so it, it's it's fun like it has nothing to do with like gifts or anything at this point it has everything to do with just like nice pretty lights and even though it's california and it's like chilly it's not quite as cold as back home but uh yeah it's cool there's just something very welcoming and, and warm feeling about the season which I, I guess that's my favorite part the older i get yeah for sure man me too you know I, and i think uh especially as as touring guys as band guys when you're gone for so long and you know everyone has their own story but it's so nice to be uh home at a time like this yeah, you yeah. know so happy holidays to you looking yeah. back on uh on 2022 my man we're coming to the end of it how was it for you great you know bayside uh you know we we the band turned 
20 and 2020, which obviously we couldn't celebrate. So we turned 21 last year and went on tour and did a 21st anniversary tour. And then this year was like kind of one of those in-between tours. We did like a co-headliner with the Rice. We did a bunch of festivals. So there wasn't like a lot of uh, kind of bigger Bayside touring. It was all like kind of like secondary stuff. We put out a bunch of new music. We have a new song. Depending on when this comes out, we have a new song, another new song coming out uh, pretty imminently. Uh, so we, we spent a lot of time like more so in the studio this year than anything. I think in total, we probably played less than 30 shows this year, which is, I don't know, kind of light, it seems like for us. Yeah, what's the but, vibe uh, of the yeah. band right now? Everyone feeling good? Yeah, yeah. Me me and Chris live out here in the town of Orange. He lives about a mile away from me. He's the drummer. And then Anthony and Jack, the singer and guitar player, uh, live in Nashville. So we're good. We're trying to probably much like you guys and any like sort of band that's been around for a long time. We're just trying to navigate like how things are changing now. You know, it's like we can't become TikTok stars. We're too old for that. <laughs> um, so we're just trying to figure out what it means to be uh you know the the million being a band for t- over two decades you've had to like and we've never broken up we've never stopped or anything like that you always have to like change with the times but figure out how to do it like in your own way you know so we're we're kind of navigating that like i said right now but the band's good yeah man that's that's you know it, it's kind of crazy and props to you that's that's one thing that the bronx and bayside definitely have in common is we've all just we've just kept going mm-hmm. you know what i mean this whole time and i'll tell you what it's not fucking easy. You know no. what I mean? It's <laughs> it's not it's not fucking easy and it takes a lot of dedication uh to what you're doing and also it takes a special relationship amongst the band and its members and uh yeah. just a certain desire and dedication to the craft. So mm-hmm. you know, if we could look back on just a, uh, overall, what are some things that you think uh, have helped you guys kind of just maintain the highs and lows of being a band for over 20 years? You know, it, I, I would say just to see a lot of our peers and who like made it and who didn't. And, you know, there are bands that ran, you know, laps around us back in the day who we're now, I would consider more successful than them. You know, it's just the, the ebb and the flow of things. I, I would say in a weird way, as much as we've always tried to be more successful, um, the consistency was really, you know, a big key to our whatever, if you want to call it success or not. Like, I think just always touring, you know, making sure that we're selling merch, obviously, is a big thing. Like, these are like the littlest things to me that like, kept our band consistent is that we paid attention to uh, and respected what our fans liked about us. And we were like, as long as we have them, we're good. We don't need to like constantly like, be searching for a big single or anything like that like i think that early on we found that the people who really liked us were our diehards and they've been with us for two decades now so uh i don't i can't really place anything specific that i would say on why we've been able to be a band for 22 years and we're you know doing as great as we've ever have but it it really just has to do with that connection with our, our our diehard fans and uh never like thinking that necessarily our music was just for us, you know, because I think a lot of bands would do that. And, you know, maybe it's a creative thing they want to try or whatever. It's like whenever we're writing a song, we legitimately are thinking, are our fans going to like this? Because they're the ones who are the most important to us. And it's not necessarily about like, well, let's try something new because we want to be more creative or let's try something new to see if we could like branch out to a, a new demographic or anything like that. It's always been like almost like our fans are in the room with us when we're writing because we want to make them happy first. So I don't know. It's it's kind of, you know, consistency, I would say, uh, has mattered the most for us. We've always kind of held like bands like bad religion or something you know like those are the bands that we want to we want to be pushing 60 and still playing you know like we don't we don't want too high we don't want too low we just want to be able to put out a record every couple of years tour a couple of times a year and uh and we're good it's it's the life you know it's it's hard to explain like yeah i'm a musician but i'm a middle class musician you know like it's it's yeah a lot of people will think of you know being a musician or anything like that or i guess at this point like djs and stuff that you have to be like super successful to to keep going but as long as you're uh decent with money and you earn a middle class wage it's the best job because you have so much time off (laughs) yeah absolutely man i think that's uh you know i I don't know if you guys have like business management or whatever but uh, one of the things that was key for us was like maintaining our 
our you know consistency and longevity was mm-hmm. eventually too just like realizing that like hey if we're gonna be a band that's only gonna be making so much money give or take a few you know highs and lows over yeah. you know we made more this year made less this year whatever there comes a point where you got <laughs> you gotta be kind of smart with what you're making yeah, you know what definitely. I mean and like and and make it space out. But that's really cool that that consistency is something that matters most to you and your fans, obviously, because, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I, I always think back to there's this Minutemen EP that I love and the artwork on the on the cover is like these uh, record label guys and they're pointing to like these yeah. charts and it says, why don't we just why don't we have them write hit songs? Yeah. <laughs> and and you go through, I mean, because, you know, I mean, when you're when you're on that that middle level, you go through so many like, uh, like, you know, you go through, okay, we're going to write songs for us. Fuck the world. <laughs> we're going to write songs for our fans. We're going to tour our asses off. We're mm-hmm. going to tour for fucking five years straight. We're burnt out. Let's try to write a hit song. That's mm-hmm. not us. What are we, you know, there's so yeah. many, like, there's so many like avenues that you go down creatively and strategically as mm-hmm. a band when you get to 15, 20 years yeah. that when you do realize it's just all about trying to fucking, stay in that lane and exactly. just cruise, you know, yeah. it's like, it, it's, it, it's such a beautiful thing when you find your lane, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think it's the hardest thing too. And yeah. And like, not every band gets that. It's like, we always just said we had to keep working hard. And the only thing that we get at the end of the day is more work. You know, it's like, you yeah. can't rest on your <laughs> laurels is when, when you're a certain size, it's not like we worked really hard and we had a hit song. And now like the downward trajectory from a hit song or hit, hit record could last decades really we've never had that so we've always just been like the harder we work the prize at the end of the tunnel is just more work you know (laughs) like that's really that's really it but yeah i mean i i'd say like you know the the almost more difficult thing these days is when you're a band for so long and people for instance like if people were 15 when they found us and connected with our first couple of records and they're 35 36 37 now it's like People have families, mortgages, you know, a lot of different things that get in the way. And people just, even though they would consider themselves super fans, they, life gets in the way of you connecting to new music the older you get. So that's why yeah. people like the stuff they grew up with. And I don't know, that's, that's, that's something I understand, but also something like I don't want to accept. <laughs> so I try to yeah. like... I'm always talking about new music with friends or like I have a radio show that I do on Spotify. It's like, I I really do try to get people to like reignite that thing that kind of got them to where they are. You know, like if you like punk and hardcore and emo and any indie stuff, you're like part of a scene, which is different than, you know, I would say a lot of other genres of music. So I, I think life gets in the way, understandably, but I do, I'm trying to, get people to understand that like new music still exists and you can connect to it maybe not exactly in the same way as you did 20 years ago but like it could be a lot more than just like a catchy tune you know like you could feel something as an adult which i think is like i know i do so i'm like i want other people to do that too yeah for sure man and that's a really cool point and that's something that honestly it's it's kind of comical uh you know how many musicians you know, the grind of, of being in a band sometimes is, is, is so nonstop. It's funny yeah. how many musicians don't listen to music. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. <laughs> I, I would almost say most at this point. <laughs> it's just yeah. Wild. We took, uh, we had a uh, scowl in the chats with us out for half of this last tour and man, dude, it was, it was so rad. It was yeah. so rad to keep, you know, the, just to see like a, a younger squad. It, mm-hmm. Dude, it was so funny. Uh, Eamon from the chats, you know, he's, talking to me and or backstage and he goes hey matt he goes you have any kids and i go i go no man i go what about you he goes no nah, man i'm 23 <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's like, I, I am a kid <laughs> yeah i was like hell yeah man but yeah. but it's cool you know like like for instance another this band white reaper that i love they just put oh, out another them. song the other day oh my god it's so good and yeah <laughs> it's it's so good and there there is so much great music out there for me personally mm-hmm. um uh you know i i for a long time wasn't you know listening to uh, a lot of new stuff, but because mm-hmm. especially, I mean, we always get the, you know, what are you listening to or what are you yeah. that? And you never, you always, even if you're listening to shit, you never know how to answer mm-hmm. those questions. Yeah, right. But I've been trying to force myself lately to do exactly that, to listen yeah. to more new music, uh, to listen to bands, even if it's not new bands that I haven't heard of or, or mm-hmm. different genres or stuff like that. 
And it's never, uh, it's never uh, a decision that you regret to listen yeah, to music, definitely. to discover new artists. You know, it's mm-hmm. always a great feeling. And now I feel like, especially guys, artists our age, with the ever changing musical, you know, business and landscape. You know, like last year, I, I kind of found myself almost being, you know, dare I say, jaded a little bit okay. about just how everything's just, you know just in chaos a little mm-hmm. bit but there's also the 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 you know the flip side of that coin is there's so many new bands out yeah. right now mm-hmm. that are doing like really 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 good especially in punk and hardcore yeah. so there's a lot of stuff to be stoked on mm-hmm. and i kind of found myself focusing on just a lot of bullshit and that you know it was able to it was cool to have new music kind of bring me out of that you know yeah, what i mean yeah yeah no going to shows you know especially around here because we get kind of too cities to go to whether it's like la or down here it's like everyone comes through here and uh yeah i mean i always feel like a sense of responsibility to our scene and our world to like introduce people to younger bands on tour too you know like we we really do with the exception of i would say like our anniversary tour which was like heavy nostalgia because it was like us we were headlining we brought census fail and hawthorne heights out um and the bomb pops open so there are like the Bomb Pops were the younger band, but they're not necessarily yeah. like a newer band. But on the Thrice tour, we brought out a band called Anxious, um, who are you know they're going to be probably they're probably going to have a great 2023. They're they're putting out some great music. Uh, on our upcoming tour, we're bringing out another band called Koyo. They're from Long Island, so uh, it's just something that like when we were a younger band, we would kill to be able to get tours consistently with bands that we should be on tour with that we could like play in front of their fans and win so like for us there's always going to be at least one or two slots on our tours for younger bands like pink shift is another band from like long island and maryland that they're doing really well on their own and we we brought them out uh in july for a couple of shows um and it's it's just really great to see like the next generation you know it's like it, it it's like i said i feel a sense of responsibility because I just know what I wanted when Bayside was put out our first record and I was 24 and we were like trying to get any tours and we like never really fit in anywhere. We weren't like punk enough for like Alkaline Trio and Bad Religion back then. And then we weren't like screamo enough, even though we were on Victory Records, we weren't like that world either. So it's kind of like that was also a weird benefit where we didn't fit in anywhere. So we just had to do our own thing all the time or we would be on those screamo tours and stick out, you know, and like the couple of people a night who would like us are still with us because they've heard something special. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I can't say enough of it. And thankfully I'm just, I can't say enough about it, about like the younger generation of bands. Cause I do think that like, there's a lot of special stuff going on right now. Yeah, man, absolutely. And it's a trip to, to be in a spot now where, you know, uh, both uh, Bronx and Bayside started. Bayside started 2000, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bronx was 2002, 2003, and now that's you know that's that's when we were young fest. Yeah, you know exactly. what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so 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 that's it. That's insane to have that coming around too. Mm-hmm. Uh, you guys were there, boots on ground yeah. for yeah. when we were young. How how was the vibe? How was it? It was it was so cool, man. <laughs> like I, I really like, you know, I, I've I've talked about it a couple times since, um, and. The word I've used and I've said it already, but like it was really validating because the the world we come from is like more warp tour and it's more club tours and stuff like that. We don't really get to do uh, any of these like Firefly Fests or Coachella or anything. Some of our some bands from our world do, um, but uh, for the most part, we don't. So all we ever get is a warp tour thing or like a random festival here and there. And this was just. The, the biggest difference between this and some of those bigger fests is that like th- that those festivals are just popular music and there's not uh, that's what links them all together is that it's popular music. What yeah. linked when we were when we were young together is like I look backstage and we've toured with 25 of the bands before <laughs> and and not for nothing. We don't tour with anyone who don't like. So I consider everyone friends, you know, so it, backstage was like the best vibe and it really did feel good to have it feel important because Warp Tour didn't feel important. You know, Warp Tour is so punk and, yeah. you know, it just was its own thing that uh, 
you know, it seemed more like work than it did like, hey, you're yeah. cool. Here's a bunch of people to play in front of. It really yeah. did seem more like work whenever we did that. Um, and and when we were young, it was just like the best vibe. Like backstage was comfortable. Uh, there was plenty of fans to go around. I think it was like 50, 60,000 people a day or something like that. Like, for instance, we played literally half of our set against Jimmy Eat World and Taking Back Sunday, and we still had plenty of people to frame, play in front of. So, um yeah, I mean, it was just really, it was cool to feel cool. I'll, I'll put it yeah. that way. <laughs> that's the Riot Fest man. is another good one. Like Riot Fest is one that I think gets it right. You know, that's that's one where, uh, what I enjoy about Riot Fest too is that they 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 kind of get some musical genres that are like adjacent to each other. You know, like we normally wouldn't get to play with System of a Down or No Doubt, but we did one year because of uh, Riot Fest. So. Uh, you know, I think there's more similarities to bands like that than people think. So it's good to like be able to share a festival uh, lineup with them. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah, Riot Fest does a good job of, you know, at, as they got bigger, you know, like you're saying, they didn't lose sight of, you know, what they initially wanted to do. They didn't just become a popular music festival. Mm -hmm. They incorporated some of that. It says, hey, we got this giant platform now. We're selling a lot of tickets. Yeah. Let's go for some, you know, let's go for some huge bands, you yeah, know, yeah. which is rad. But the core uh, of Riot Fest is, is still the same, and, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a beautiful thing. Um, let's get into your musical story, my man, because yeah. I, I, I'm interested in figuring this out <laughs> here. So you're an East Coast guy. Yeah. Uh, where were you born? Uh, Long Island. Okay. Yep. Long I'm Island. I've lived what was, here six uh, years now. Yeah. What was, what was childhood in Long Island like? Um, well, my, my father and mother, my father was born in Iran. He came here for school, met my mother, and they had me pretty early, like early 20s. Uh, and my father was an immigrant, so he was just like literally just trying to like make ends meet with his new wife and and, and kid. So uh, I was an only child until I was nine, so I was a spoiled little brat. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, it was pretty chill. Just a very, like, I think normal, like play with the kids on the block, you know, like I'd play sports outside, that sort of thing. Uh, really liked hockey growing up and uh, always it's weird be that I would say I would say it's weird's not the right word but music was like always in our household as much as like I would say anyone else's household because of MTV and like how radio was back then yeah. so I did always like growing up really like the obvious like Madonna Michael Jackson that sort of thing but What's strange is because my parents didn't like really have a musical background, like like bands like the Beatles and Led Zeppelin like weren't a part of the house because those bands necessar weren't necessarily on MTV. So I yeah. was always listening to like popular music, and I think music in my household was like always on, but it wasn't like my parents necessarily had taste to give to me, which is interesting because come early '90s and alternative music, I started to see a little bit more of like oh well pearl jam and nirvana and uh soundgarden and allison chains i'm like you started to see like the seeds of a scene but then yeah. like green day and and offspring that was what really got me so like even though i was from the east coast it's more like west coast music and punk music that got me um got me to pick up a bass um yeah and but it also got me to find my local scene because i remember uh I was in, there was one or two record stores on Long Island that I would go to that would have flyers on the wall. And uh, the Queers were playing, and the Queers were on Lookout Records, and I only knew yeah. them because Green Day was on Lookout Records. And I was like, <laughs> the Queers are playing like two towns over? Uh, and uh, yeah, so then I found at a punk show my local hardcore scene. So that's when I started to just go to every show because I was like, uh, there's a warehouse of people who like look like me over here, <laughs> dress yeah. like me and listen to the same music as me. So I'm going to go there. So that was it. <laughs> I was I was 15 years old. I went to every show and uh, yeah, it all kind of really, really started for me when I was still a senior in high school and Eddie Reyes of like Taking Back Sunday fame at this point, he was starting a new band. Uh, which went on to be the movie life. And I played bass for the okay. first two demos. Uh, and Vinnie Caruana, who does the movie life, and I'm the Avalanche. Uh, yeah, we all kind of just started a band. I was still a senior in high school. So, nice. Did uh, you take yeah. bass lessons or, or did you uh, learn from, how did, how did that come about? Yeah, it, 
technically I did <laughs> like once or twice a week for a little bit, probably for like half a year maybe, would go in for bass lessons. But all the bass lessons were was me bringing in a CD and telling like the teacher to teach me the song, <laughs> you know? So like yeah. it wasn't necessarily any like, uh, you know, classical kind of any sort of training like that. It was It was more like, here's how to play this Green Day song. I'm going to go learn it yeah and did, you, did you learn the long view did you learn yeah, the long yeah. view intro totally. exactly <laughs> so but it's funny though because then eventually you find rancid which is the craziest bass player like ever and yeah. i bring in those and like i would just watch my teachers like face melt he's like i i don't know i don't know how to play yeah, that <laughs> this is beyond yeah yeah this is beyond my realm this is yeah, over yeah. my over my pay grade exactly what uh <laughs> what do you think of uh, do you play with your fingers or pick or both what do you uh, do pick there was a time probably like 15 years or so where i tried to like get a little bit more into finger playing but uh it just it's never creepy, really yeah. like it didn't finger really work with creepy. what we did yeah 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah i just i and it's it's not like well nothing obviously nothing against it but mm -hmm. it's not you know it, I've, i think aesthetically it doesn't look as cool especially oh, in the not. punk rock world you know yeah. um you know but yeah, I'm always a little a little wary of No, uh, whenever I uh, hear uh, the descendants, I'm like <laughs> yeah. these are Carl, so good, man. Dude, but Carl's just play his music. Like, <laughs> he's crazy, but like I I just yeah. I'm like just it would be so much better for you, man. Just use a pick. It'll be easier. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's one of those dudes that when you talk to him, you're like it all makes sense. You yeah, know yeah. what I mean? Like the type the type of bass player that he is cuz yeah, he's just yeah. a maniac of a human being <laughs> as well. Yeah, you we know, just what? played with them in uh, Ohio. Hawthorne Heights put together a, a, a festival out there, which was basically like when we were young, light and had the sentence <laughs> as the headliner. It was pretty cool. It was great to see them again. Awesome, man. Was uh, so you mentioned, you know, Green Day, you know, uh, Rancid, obviously, Offspring, mm -hmm. you know, Green Day, Offspring, especially breaking through that whole, uh, you know, kind of skate bunk explosion. Yeah. Um, what were some other bands that you were into around that time? Um, one of the earlier ones was Bouncing Souls, more in their hat right yeah, now. They, they were yeah. kind of like my local heroes, you know, like they were yeah. from Jersey, but they played Long Island a lot. And being that what really broke through for me was West Coast Punk. Bouncing Souls had their own thing going on, but they, they leaned a little bit more in that direction than, you know, it was like yeah. almost like East, it was almost like East Coast styled west coast punk <laughs> and it was fun um and like i said they, they played all the time and and uh I would, I would get to see them a bunch so um yeah i mean i really was just into like fat records epitaph type stuff mill and colin yeah, was a dude. big one for me um mill yeah. and colin was so good yeah. Dude. Yeah, dude that that whole that that was my you know my whole scene as well and it's like you know, it was uh, you. It was really cool being on the West Coast for it. You know, because mm -hmm. like you mentioned, a lot of them were West Coast bands. Yeah. And I, dude, I remember it's so funny. Like I remember like the first time Bronx played with like Lagwagon. I was yeah. like, dude, it's like, dude, yeah. <laughs> it's <crazy. laughs> this is pretty, this is this is pretty cool. You know, yeah. and like, and then, you know, you're talking these guys because it was. I mean, yeah, that era of shows to you know mid late '90s, early like you know before the 2000s hit. Mm -hmm. Those shows were, I mean, that was kind of like my prime of just like, you know, end of high school, post mm -hmm. high school, just who cares what I'm doing with my life? I'm just going to go to shows <laughs> every night. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And and there were so many great bands uh, and it was just a really cool time. You know, it's, it's so funny because I, I, for some reason, you know, the skate punk culture, it, it gets it, it, it didn't age well, I guess, yeah. as, as a lot of people. Unfortunately, think. Yeah. a lot of people say, but it's. It's not as definitely not as cool as like saying you went to go see, you know, Black Flag or, or yeah. whatever, you know, but it's what we got, you know, what I mean? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's what we got and it's all good. You know, there was yeah. some great records came out of that time, too. Like, you know, the, the oh, my God, the, I mean, the first that first first two Melancholy records were great. Yeah. Bad Religion was just cranking out classics. Yeah. It no was, Use it for a Name. Time, that was a, that was a big one for me, too. Yeah. You know, yeah, no, no Use, use was, was awesome was just you know i think i feel like this year a little bit too for the first time in a while like reconnected with them and uh and just really they they were i would say they were almost like they were top five for me back then for sure like they were they they almost like branched that like yes it was punk but like the way he wrote songs and lyrically was leaned a little bit more like emotional and emo you know and, and yeah. then he had obviously political stuff too but like which was the more punk stuff but he really did especially the way he sang like it it, it was definitely uh somewhere in there was a bridge to like emo 
like more emotional yeah. punk, which was great. Yeah, for sure. Amazing voice, Tony Sly. Yeah. Leche Con Carne was a great record. Totally. Daily Grind, great record. Yeah, yeah. You know, those those records are fucking awesome. Yeah, classics. Um, so you mentioned, you know, you you played you played played bass in uh, movie life yep. before because you joined Bayside in two thousand four, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What was your awareness of the band before you joined? How'd you um, meet the guys? So there was like a. I guess it was early 2000s. My friend, um, Christian McKnight, who's a Long Island like promoter uh, and is still going strong. He had like, I want to say like an hour on a local rock station. Uh, I don't know if it was K-Rock back then or like WLIR is probably actually what it was. 92.7 WLIR, uh, where he would play like some local bands and stuff like that. And I remember hearing Anthony on there, our singer, um, and they played a song called Masterpiece. And I was like, this kind of sounds like like punk, you know, like it's it's yeah. a different kind. It's a different version of punk because it was like now that I've been in the band forever, uh, I wasn't on the first record. So I heard them play this song and I was like, it sounds different, though. And I realized it's like tuned down to like drop C and like it just gave it this like different feel. Um, so I had awareness. Um, I was playing in another band called... Uh, real like we had one demo and it was just me and my friends it was called keep breathing at the time and we actually got a show with bayside and i remember back then being like they're they have a record deal bayside has a record deal we should give them our demo and see if they could like bayside could give our demo to victory records you know like just at least we could get hurt or whatever um so i actually years a couple of years later maybe two two years or so um i was working a mall job there had just been like the first urban outfitters to like be in a mall ever. And I was working there and uh, I actually, I was like men's store manager or something like that. And my friend Heather hit me up and was like, Hey, my friend uh, tours and needs a job for like when he's not on tour or whatever. Could you get him a job? Cause I figure you understand how that goes. And I was like, yeah, send him in. And it wound up being Anthony, our singer, who needed the job. So he worked a couple of shifts. Like, we hung out a little bit. I gave him my current band's demo, all this stuff. And uh, what's funny, the story goes, is that he was, Bayside was about to go on tour with Fall Out Boy. It was the summer of 2004. So they were still playing, like, four or 500 capacity rooms. But yeah, it was, like, yeah. sold out for months yeah, before the tour was, even happened. It was on its way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, he knew I played. He came to see my band and all this stuff. So um, before, like his last shift before he went on that tour, he's like, kind of not really getting along with my bass player. Pretty sure he's going to quit. So like maybe you should like think about being, would you want to play again? Like you could probably be in the band like by the end of the summer so he goes on tour all summer he comes back and he's like well my bass player and drummer quit (laughs) so (laughs) and it was it was weird i was 24 i had kind of um i was happy with my job at the time was making good money it was fun um but i kind of it's funny now that i'm 42 i'm like i was thinking when I was 24, I'm like, I'm getting kind of old. I can't just like be in a band for you know? like 24 thinking that. And I was like, I might as well give it one more shot. They have a record deal. They have a booking agent. Like they're, they're doing okay. And by the end of the summer, yeah, we were, we were touring at that point. Like Hawthorne Heights was like becoming a thing. So we were buddies with them and we're touring with them a bunch. Taking back Sunday and Thursday had become a thing um, by then. So it was, uh, it was really the, the like early era of that, like, yeah emo scene just starting so uh so yeah it just became work immediately though you know like it really was something that we before i was in the band that first bayside record literally came with like a sticker on it that said like if like this is the the next thursday and taking back sunday bayside you know like the marketing that victory records had back then was ridiculous but uh obviously that didn't happen we weren't the next thursday or taking back sunday but (laughs) but uh yeah it just it became something uh something pretty cool like right after that first record because half the band changed we got a new drummer and me at the same time and we kind of found like more so the like ground level of what Bayside went on to be. Like if if you lay out all of our records, the outlier is the first one because it was yeah. like half a different band. Um, actually, the bass player wrote the lyrics, so that wasn't even like Anthony's thoughts that, that on on those records. So um, so that's kind of the outlier, I would say. Like really, and what what we named our second record, we 
we named our second record it was just self-titled because we felt yeah. like it was like a new beginning kind of so uh so yeah that was that was kind of the journey into bayside was like that's dope man. me being 24 and thinking i was old and this was my last chance to be in a band <laughs> <laughs> and yeah i mean and that time too um you know was a special time in you know quote unquote emo music mm-hmm. um and and just like alternative music in general like independent wise because yeah. You know, there was just labels were super excited to sign guitar bands. Mm-hmm. You know, Bronx kind of fell into that last wave of of you know, at the drive-in, just kicked open the door for yeah, yeah. so many bands just to get signed. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it was super cool. And and then you know the emo explosion that happened. Fallout Boys, you know, starting to build, do that thing. Yeah, like you said, Hawthorne Heights, Taking Back Sunday, all those bands. You know, and Thursday too, man. That the mm-hmm. the full was it full collapse and war yep. all the time. Those records, yeah, yeah. you know, those they were on island with us. So there was just mm-hmm. a whole bunch of things happening, and it was a, it was a really cool time to be, you know, to like to be twenty four, yeah. to be you know in a band, and you know, it it's it, I want to talk about this with you. I hope it's okay if we talk about the accident for a yeah, second. Yeah. Is that of cool? Course. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, because like you're saying, I mean, you're off to the races things are are amazing you're playing mm-hmm. in a band and then you know something tragic happened to you guys you flip your van mm-hmm. uh you know your drummer john passes away mm-hmm. you you know hurt your back yeah, yeah. real bad mm-hmm. what like i don't want to make you relive it but just oh, okay. uh, how, okay. what like what was that what was that like like how are you well because that's just one of those moments just like boom, yeah yeah you know? it, what i really like think back to all that because it is like such a weird traumatic event that like i do remember like flashes of it happening like i don't remember the actual accident happening i was you remember those days of being on an overnight drive in a van i was like Mm -hmm. sleeping when it happened uh and i actually was like woke up outside of the van like i woke up on the ground outside the van so i was clearly thrown from the van i had broke my uh l4 vertebrae and i just remember like chaos then um and like you said, our, our drummer John passed away, and I had to go into you know basically four months of you know healing and rehab and stuff like that afterwards. Um, I like I to me, I just took it like I know it wasn't fair what happened to us, but I took it kind of personally because I'm like we're just out here working, you know, we're busting our ass. At that point, it was we were on a huge tour, and we were like actually like arguing with our record label because he was trying to like sell us our own cds at like not a good price you know you know like we were we're like we're out here on a full ass tour with only your bands on it and you're trying to like nickel and dime us for cds when we could be selling cds and building our career so we we wound up playing four shows i remember just really being like already so like annoyed with our record label and how they were treating us at that point so i just really like and this is me being like immature with the time but whatever i was literally 24 it was like i just really took it all personally i'm like why did this happen to us you know like it's not fair why did this happen why this is gonna like stall things um you know i don't necessarily like no one knows how to deal with anything like that you know it's like we literally had a death in the band and two weeks later you know we we had to have one conversation which is like well is that is the band over or is it not let's start there you know um and anthony and jack met up with the rest of the tour two weeks later and just played acoustic and that was like you know really the first turning point for the band was yeah yes yes we're gonna keep going and how is it gonna look after that so we uh yeah, two years later, we found Chris, uh, who's, you know, that's been the Bayside lineup since 2006 at this point. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that that's my biggest, like, takeaway when I think about that is, like, I don't know what I expected to happen, but, like, post-accident, but I did kind of, like, take it personally that it happened in the first place, which there's really no one to blame, but also, like, it just, it did hurt to be like, we're just out here working, you know, like, what, like, just let us work i don't know like it it was just a patch of ice in a road in wyoming on halloween you know like it's it's that's what took us out but i would just like really was so like downtrodden because i'm like we just let us work (laughs) yeah man and that's just just a lot to handle you know on 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 you know as being as young as everyone was and you know it's like and i remember at that time i remember when it happened and i remember at that time too 
like there was a lo- there was a lot of van shit happening yeah. around those couple years, mm-hmm. man. I mean, people we we flipped a van at one point. Luckily, everyone was okay, but I was driving, man. It was yeah. absolutely terrifying. And you know, I'm just uh, I, I, that's such a powerful moment for you guys, mm-hmm. you know, to to continue to to yeah. you know to want to continue on. And and honestly, I think that when a band goes through something you know tragic like that, and you do decide to carry on. It, 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 you know, I think there's a reason like you're talking about that you guys have been a band for over 20 mm-hmm. years and you've been going the whole time because it's yeah. just that's the attitude, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it is. No, nothing, nothing's gonna stop us, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Uh, yeah. which is which is really cool and really powerful. And, and you know, going into I, I wanted to talk about Walking Wounded because mm-hmm. I imagine going into that record, there was a lot of emotion going into yeah. it. Um, what was what, what was the writing process or recording process like for that record? Uh, well, you did that in New York and, uh, the, the title, I don't know if this like stories, I know it's out there, but it might not be like common knowledge, but the, even the title from that record, um, that was something that I heard one of the EMTs say about the rest of the band while I was in a stretcher getting in the ambulance was he referred to everyone else as the walking wounded. And I was just wow. like, I know it broke my back, but I got to remember that because that's yeah. <laughs> that, that could yeah. be that could be something for us. So when we were writing that record, you know, like I brought that up, and it had you know, besides it, obviously sounding cool, but it it had relevance to what yeah. had happened to us. So it was a it, it was a, it made a lot of sense. But uh, yeah, that record we were exploring things a little, you know, sonically and and really. It was our follow up to our unofficial first record, kind of, because that second record was where we kind of like adjusted our sound a little bit and then we expanded it even more with our third record and uh, we recorded in New York. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it felt important while we were doing it. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's still plenty of jams on there that we, you know, that we, uh, that we play to this day. I would say like, if people connect to anything, it's our second and third records. Like those are those are our classic records. So um, those are still songs that like are mandatory to play almost. You know, like the couple of bigger songs from that record. Uh, but yeah, the the process was you know, it's weird. The first let's see, that record we did in New York. The second one we did in New York. Our fourth one we actually did out here in Santa Monica. We we used the Red Bull Studios for that one. Um, oh, so that was more of like an experience. Days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was more of an experience, like as far as like we had never spent that much time in California. You know, we were out here yeah. for like whatever a month, month and a half. Uh, and and the way we looked at that record, which is like kind of like our, I don't know, it's our like fan favorite. You know, like our real okay. diehard fans love that, but everyone else kind of never heard it. I mean, <laughs> we just hated like. <clears throat> being on victory records so much that we fulfilled our contract as soon as we could you know like we did a record a year basically for four years so we could (laughs) and so (laughs) shutter is the fourth record and there's some like i would say underdeveloped ideas on there because we were just like let's just do like that's fine you know let's go yeah um so uh so yeah it's uh you know What's your guys' writing process like? Like, how do you, um, you know, do you guys, does this one person write most of the stuff? Yeah. Do you guys collaborate? How, mm-hmm. how does it all go down? I mean, it's all been changing for sure. I mean, back in the day, I mean, Anthony's the primary songwriter for sure, and he still is. Uh, it's a lot more collaborative now than it has been yeah. but um, in the past. But, um, but yeah, back then was literally like, you know, just recording demos on cassettes and stuff like that and, and literally needing to be in a room for eight ten hours a day writing um these days obviously we don't live in the same city but technology is such that we've like we've legitimately like recorded and released like cover songs where we had never been in the studio together you know like we wouldn't do that with our with a nor with an actual new bayside song but uh these days we're we're uh, chris our drummer has a studio here and then uh anthony and jack are able to record in nashville so we kind of just send ideas up to a certain point where we're like, yeah. this is something we need to work on. Then we'll get in a room and record or get in a room and write and like hash out the song and stuff like that. Um, and then we've done our last couple of records and releases uh, actually out here with Cameron Webb in Santa Ana. So uh, yeah, Cameron's so, yeah. awesome. Yeah, Cameron's the best. He's he's helped us like 
kind of uh, focus a little bit more of a like heavier and aggressive sound for the last couple of releases, um, which is something that we've were you know trying to like amplify. Was like Jack's a great metal player, you know, like we we have this punk side to us and all this stuff. So we're like, let's amplify those things that make us unique and like go in that direction. So it's still something that we're like working on is like getting heavier, getting more aggressive, getting darker, like whatever it is. So, um, so yeah, that's been going great with camera. But yeah, these days it's more like we decide, like Anthony will send an idea for a song. We'll either like it or not. Pump it or then, dump it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then we kind of get it to a point where we're like, okay, this is worth working on. We hop into a room, and then really when we're with Cameron is when things get finalized. So, uh, yeah, we just actually, right before when we were Young Festival, finished up another three songs. And like I said earlier, one of them's coming out pretty soon, like within days, awesome. I would say. So uh, that's even changing. You know, it's like the song has only existed for two months, and people are about to hear it. <laughs> yeah, and how, crazy. like... At, at, how militant are you guys? How's like when it comes to like, you know, because for me as as a singer uh, and and lyricist, there sometimes there's some songs that have just gotten away from me. And going forward, I always I always think about like, uh, you know, like I always want to say, hey, like this song's not going to see the light of day unless it's absolutely perfect, mm -hmm. you know. But then it always it all something always gets through, you know what I mean? Like. Are, are you guys, you get to a point when the song's finished where you're like, cool, or are you super meticulous about, you know, every note, every instrument as a band, or is it pretty, is it, is it, is it pretty casual? You know what I mean? No, oh, I lost your, uh, hold on real quick. I think I lost there we your, go. there you go. Am yeah, I, cool. Okay. Sorry. Yep. I muted it because my dog's barking. <laughs> um, That's all good, man. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's casual. I think it's, you know, pretty planned out like yeah. what goes on. Um, but I think the one we've learned is to, um, I think demoitis is for sure a thing that we've always yes. struggled with. So I think what we're learning now and like really in the last year or two is to not overdevelop songs before we get into the studio. I think we have the idea. We don't really mess with structure. Like we do really adhere to like a pop structure for the most part when it comes to songwriting yeah. um and uh yeah i think what we're learning now is to not develop things so hard that like for instance if cameron is like let's not do this it's not something we've all been in love with for like six yeah, months that we're gonna have a hard you. time so i think that that's one thing that we've we've learned to do um and and yeah i think it's it's about like pushing our own boundaries at this point like one thing that like i've said like we can't disappoint our fans like our fans are our yeah. fans and we don't want them to like take a record off take a record cycle off or not uh, connecting th to songs is one thing like i mentioned but like they have to at least audibly like sonically like the song you know whether or not yeah. it's connects with them you know emotionally or spiritually it has to at least be like something they could sing and and uh feel something to like physically like they want to dance or something yeah. um but uh but yeah it's it's definitely something that we're trying to improve because what else do we have it's so difficult to say like in, in after being a band this long and how priorities have kind of always changed in like these windows of like early 2000s everything was downloadable then it became cheap cds then it became streaming yeah. and now it's becoming like even past streaming is you know social media type stuff um we're always having to evolve but we just know that like all we have is the music you know we're yeah. lucky enough to have like a certain aesthetic as far as like our logo and and how our merch looks and stuff like that but at the end of the day like the four of us aren't like emo goth dudes you know <laughs> like we don't yeah. personally look a certain way but um <laughs> i i think like the what we present with our logo and our merch and our like the naming tours and and naming records and naming songs and stuff like that has a little bit more of the imagery there but um yeah all we have is the music though like everything has to revolve around new music all the time to kind yeah. of spark people to even listen to the older stuff you know it's like we write new songs i was just talking to jack yesterday uh our guitar player and i was like we have to write songs and whether people connect to them or not 
we have to write songs so we could go on tour and play the old songs you know like that's yeah, really yeah, yeah, that's yeah. really how it is at this point um so that that's kind of that's kind of where we're at it's cool to have that you know it's <laughs> it's great to have music as the anchor you know what i mean cuz it's like at the end of the day like you're talking about especially being a band for so long you know, you can have, oh, what should we, you know, what's our, what are we going to do this year? You know, we're going to do this, that, and you, you want to try new things. You want to go maybe a, a couple different directions. But at the end of the day, nothing really happens without new music or, you know, some sort of song or something based around what you've either written in the past or what you're going to write in the future. So it really is a great equalizer. And it, it's great to know at least out of all the crazy things that are happening in the music industry that at least music still has that power, you know, for most of us, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's the, it's the only thing that really matters. And it's what yeah. you have to base, you know, everything you do off of, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I want to wrap with you about singles versus albums, because, you know, as, as bands get older and like you said, everyone has, you know, they're moving in different places, you know, Bronx has guys in Texas and Louisville and, you know, it, every band's more spread out now. I'm sure you mm -hmm. can work online, but, Writing a full length record is a pretty daunting task. Yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it is. It, and and it, you know, then it's like the whole aspect of, you know, if you're going to record it, who you're going to record it with. If the person's, you know, awesome, who's going to pay for it? If the label, if that makes sense, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but where do you, where do you sit and, and where does the band sit as far as like, you know, today's landscape of, of the, the modern listener attention span yeah. and, you know, versus old school, we're going to make a fucking record and we're mm -hmm. going to put it out versus, you know, a single, you put out a single a year for the next 10 years. That's yeah, not yeah. necessarily a bad strategy. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean? we're, so we're, what do you think about it? We're trying something new. I mean, so in 2019, we put out a record called Interrobang. It was the first one we did with Cameron Webb. And it was one of our more like immediate like successes like there was yeah. heavier stuff on it and people really liked the the singles that we put out right away which was a good feeling but we did try that was the first time we tried a non-traditional like album release where we announced the record was coming out like two weeks before it came out and released four singles in that time so it was kind of like bayside blitz for two weeks yeah um and it did well the the tour did well and that was literally though late 2019 we did one tour on it and then yeah. the pandemic happened for two years. So regardless, it went well, but we didn't like necessarily get to support that record as much as we would have liked. And now we're trying something actually even more new because like what you said, writing a full length re record is daunting in itself. But the atmosphere for people to listen to and spend time with a full length record is like not a thing really anymore yeah. so like and yeah. like i'm not i'm not even like talking shit like because i don't you know i listen to music i think differently than a lot of other people but there's a lot of new music like you said and it's becoming harder and harder to concentrate on a full record and then from our perspective a record cycle used to be two years and then it was one year and now it's like could be a month, you know, it could be yeah. two weeks. It's, it's, it's Straight hard up, to, it's to stress about 10, 15 songs and then have it just be done in two weeks after it's released. So we're, we're trying right now both ways where we're concentrating on chunks of songs. We did three songs, um, that culminated with like a three song EP that is out. The next three will be another EP and then we'll end with like a final four songs that will equal like a 10 song record. So we're yeah. trying that. I don't necessarily know if it's better or worse, but we're doing it, you know, like, yeah. I, don't... I mean, that's kind of, you just gotta, you gotta throw shit out yeah. there and see what sticks at this yeah. point, you know, but I, I agree with you. It's like a, the, you know, it's not that the album is dead because it's mm -hmm. definitely not. But, you know, I think there's a certain argument to say that it's definitely dying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sure. And you can, you can put it out. You know, especially I think a lot of it may depend on where you're at as as a band, you know, mm -hmm. or as an artist, because, you know, obviously, you know, maybe if, if it's your first record or your 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 even the second record, maybe that's more of a time for a, a full length. Mm -hmm. But I mean, who knows now, dude? It's so crazy. Like yeah. it's so crazy. Like I, as much as I want to, like, think about writing an album, you know, like we did the same thing on our, on our last record. And, you know, the cycle thing is a big thing we're dealing with now. Cause mm -hmm. it's like, 
you know, that record was written in 2019. It didn't come out till 2021. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we toured a little bit like, like in 2000 or like, Late 2021, we did like Rancid support tour, yeah, and then yeah. we did a little bit of touring. I saw you guys in Vegas. Year. Yeah, but <laughs> it's like you know, at that point, I mean, three, four years. If you're like you're as an artist, you're. I mean, you're never over it, but you're mm -hmm. you're over that. You're over the. You know, it's not a new record anymore. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean. Yeah. And as much as you don't want to admit it for your fans, it's not a fucking new record for them anymore either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so it's like. Yeah, I mean, we're like we're doing. We're putting together a, a UK Europe tour right now for mm -hmm. for Bronx Six for 2023 because we yeah. still haven't done like a, a full yeah. Europe run yet, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're doing that, and then we're also like thinking about okay, uh, you know, we're already you, you got to think about what's next. You know, you mm -hmm. got to write, either do Bronx or El Bronx or whatever. But yeah. it's just super crazy, you know, and it's it's super. It's uh, it's exciting. I think for for me, I'm not sure how it is for you guys because I like I like like the not necessarily the business side of it, but mm -hmm. the strategic side of like figuring out what's going to work yeah. best and, and all that mm -hmm. stuff. It's, it's cool. You know, it's fun. When it's you're, fun when you're until you like what I'm personally feeling is like, it's fun until you don't necessarily get the results or any results, oh, you know? Dude, Cause it's like, dude. it's turning me. I'm like, do I have a control thing? Do I have a control problem? Cause like, <laughs> all I want to know is that like, a plus b <laughs> equals what i thought it was and that's yeah. what's frustrating right now it's like for instance like so we put out these three songs a lot of success these days has to do with playlisting or being on like serious xm station or something you know yeah, like yeah, it's yeah. still kind of the same game just new technology it's basically trying to get on the radio um so our first single got on like a bigger rock playlist and that's trucking that's doing great um the second song was a little bit more of a traditional like Bayside punk song and our fans liked it and it did fine. But the third song called Just Like Home, it's about a month old or something at this point. We named our tour after it that we're going on in February. We thought it was like the, it, we still think it's an absolute banger and it's one of the least like reactive songs we've released in years. Like it's not going well. It's not even going average. It's going below average. And we're just like, man, we really thought we had something with this one. Yeah. And it's now affected, like, snowballed how early we're releasing more new music because we're like, wow, this is doing n almost nothing. So I don't know if that's affecting, like, the tour necessarily. I'm like, that seems like not a good idea now that we named the tour after a song. We're probably, like, not even going to have to play <laughs> because no one's listening to it. Um, yeah. And it's just like, you know, I'm joking with everyone. I'm like, I'm heartbroken. I thought that song was so cool and so good, and now I'm just like – it's just doing nothing so like analytically you know you get to see real time like who's listening yeah. to what and all this stuff so we're just like yeah it's just not happening so we bumped up this next batch of songs to come out earlier because we're like it's not happening so let's 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 try again with another new song so yeah it's it's just frustrating because like you'd like to think that you know we do put thought into all these things and when it doesn't work it's more like i'm like do we know what we're doing <laughs> yeah no, it's a trip. It is, man. It's tough, and, and and there's been moments like that for us for sure over the last, over the last year. With just even when it's just like you know, you know, you, you put putting tours together or this. I mean, it's all the landscape right now is so unpredictable. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's super crazy, um, and and it's tough when you really got to have like you really got to plan, you know, two, three, four, five steps ahead these days because for that exact situation like you're talking about, you know. You think, you know, you set yourself up to release one song, two songs, and a third song's a home run, and the third song ends up striking out. Yeah. You're like, oh, oh shit, you know? Yeah. That's exactly <laughs> what we're doing. It's where we're at right now. Yeah, it's it's crazy, man. It's 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 super wild, but it's it's uh it's definitely buy the ticket, take the ride right now. Yeah, and yeah. you guys got the is it the home sweet home tour in February? Uh, just with, like uh, home. Just like home, yep. just like home mm -hmm. in February with uh, Koyo and is it I am Avalanche? Yep, I'm the Avalanche. Yep, which they haven't. Uh, you know, that's that's Finny from the Movie Life. Uh, yeah. We toured with them a bunch back in the day, and they've been they put out music and toured a little bit here and there. But this is their first like full U.S. tour in like seven years or something. They're some of our best friends, so uh, it'll be great to like be able to like hang out with them for a month. And then Koyo, we haven't met, but they're from Long Island, and they sound like. All, all all our old bands you know like they have that <laughs> long island sound so uh that's why we also called it just like home it's all new york bands and uh and you know we're, we we right keep on. in touch and we're we're you know best buds with i'm an avalanche and it'll be really good to to share a stage with them again 
Dope, man. Do you have uh, as far as after that next year? Do you guys have a lot, a lot on the, a lot on the burners, or what are you guys uh, looking at? I mean, all that we have to do is record those final four songs, so we could cool. like, finish the record, um, and then that's it. We we kind of we plan this tour to be early in the year, so we could have the rest of the year open for whatever comes our way. You know, like we're yeah. we're like I've said, I feel like a million times, like we're we're always working hard, but like we still want to like get a support tour, you know, like, I don't know who could yeah. take us out, but we would love to do a support tour. Um, and if that doesn't happen, then what we did this year was kind of like supplement touring with a lot of festivals. So that's another idea. Uh, we have this whole other like leg of our career that is acoustic based and we haven't done an acoustic tour, um, in uh, like five years at this point. So that's always something that we could, we could pull together. So we have ideas. I know that for the second half of the year, we'll have something. Cause at that point, like the album will be done and probably looking at like the final four songs starting to be released. Like I would say like late summer. So I'm sure yeah. we'll have something cooking for the fall. Um, and, uh, that's it. Then uh, after that, it's it's interesting because this is um, we don't really know what comes next for us as far as like record uh, a record deal goes. We, we've been on Hopeless Records since like 2015 or so, and this is technically our last like contractual record with them. So we have to like we're at like a crossroads where we're like, do they want to sign us? Do we want to do this? Uh, like, I think we have like a conversation to be had for sure to yeah. figure out what comes next, but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they, they've been great and they've been like supportive with how we're releasing this too. Like, I think they obviously know that like record cycles are and a sketchy thing. So they were yeah, like, labels Let's just... are, labels are, yeah, labels <laughs> are dying right now too. Yeah. You know, every, everyone's feeling it. And, and, and it's, it's, it's extra more, it's like more stressful now because, you know, you, whether it's agents, labels, bands, managers, uh, you know, everything is like, so hard to like you know you, you want to be able to look at your year and and see it all down on paper yeah. and everything is so last minute now yeah and everything is like it's so just the on top of trying to figure out what you're doing the extra kind of fear of the unknown uh an empty calendar or not necessarily being able to you know figure out when if how the band's going to make money in the yeah. next year two years it's it, it's a it's a wild time right now. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> scary. And then throw into the throw into the mix that a pandemic happened. We're like, do we yeah. have to worry about like huge worldwide emergencies now? Like, it's a it's a terrible like a terrible thing. Like, we went on tour pretty early in like the comeback. Like, we were uh, after the pandemic. Like, we were on tour late August of 2021. Like things were just opening. Like we had canceled yeah. that tour twice, I think, at that point. And we went on tour with like full COVID protocol, like vaccinations and like tests need needed to be done for a lot of things. And like that was a great tour, but it was still I mean, we're still feeling the effects of people not buying tickets, you know, or yeah. not being comfortable to be in crowds and stuff like that. So that tour was like a pretty massive success. And at the same time, we had hundreds of people every day who no showed, who had tickets yeah. who didn't come. So it was, it was wild. I think it's now like I think people, um, I think are a little like skittish with buying the tickets, you know. So it's like now that's like something else that that we all have to deal with. But yeah, that early tour was like <laughs> wow. There was I think one of the worst ones was like Orlando, where like literally over five hundred ticket holders just didn't come. So, it was that's like, so wow. yeah, that's crazy. That's how that rancid dropkick tour was. You mm -hmm. know, there was like it was great to be back out. It was fucking awesome. And yeah. the, the, and and, you know, there was a good amount of people every mm -hmm. night. But, you know, you, you, you talk to, you know, uh, rancid's TM or, or yeah. dropkicks guy and they're like, yeah, there's you know, there's there's a lot of people not showing up. You yeah, know what yeah. I mean? So that's just how it was in the beginning. And now it's like. It's dope. People are stoked to go back and see concerts, but the economy sucks so bad they got to pay for one ticket, yeah. you know, every every month or or yeah, you know right. every couple months or whatever, yeah. you know. So, yeah. um, but right on, man. Uh, I know you got a lot of stuff going on too outside of music. You mentioned the podcast. Yeah. Where? How did that come about? Where can people find it? Uh, well, I have two. That's how much free time nice. I have. <laughs> the, the, the radio show is just something I do on my own. And it's it's more an hour of like, you know, dare I say college radio than it is a podcast. It's just me. Cool. Uh, I pick 10 songs a week and kind of 
talk about them. It's like, you know, it's a 40 minute listen, basically. Um, yeah. I've tried to do stuff like that forever, but it's obviously hard and uh, not legal to stream other people's music <laughs> or give other people's <laughs> music away for free. So I've always tried to do that uh, to varying degrees. And uh, within the last two years or so, Spotify bought Anchor and in a about a year and a half ago, they allowed you to like put music into your podcasts. So um, it only lives on Spotify. That's the that's the the, the catch there. So yeah, uh, it's called the Radio Radio Show. It's a quick listen. I try to introduce people to new bands or at least um, show people like the connection between like older bands and you know like. Uh, yeah. like that band I mentioned earlier, Pink Shift. I'm like, if you liked early Paramore, you would like Pink Shift because they're like a more punk and like heavier Paramore from back in the day. And the more support they get now, maybe they could turn into the next Paramore. Who knows? You know, it's like that sort of thing. But uh, my other podcast is the one actually, um, it was Ryan Key from Yellow Card and Adam from Story of the Year. They started a Star Wars podcast early 2020. So before the pandemic, uh, they were out here at Disneyland, and um, I was a guest on the podcast. So they came to my house, like literally right here where I'm recording <laughs> now. We recorded a podcast, and I think either later that day or the next day, Ryan was like, hey, that was really awesome. Do you, Would you just want to be a host with us? Because, you know, we're all musicians, Star Wars, blah, blah, blah. So by April, I was like a regular host on that, and that's been like a really, really like great part of my life for the last two years because at that point like I like Star Wars a lot obviously enough to have a podcast and it's one of my earliest like memories and like happy childhood you know memories but in my in my old like the older I've gotten like community has been so important to me so like yeah. being a part of a Star Wars community that like like uh like shepherds in like positivity and stuff is like it that's been like one of the my more favorite things that like has happened in recent memory is like you we're all in a band forever but when you like and we're all grateful for that but we started something new that like people like and i'm like this is really cool like we me ryan and adam were walking around star wars celebration which is like the big convention uh it was in anaheim in uh, may and people were coming up to us like three musicians that they recognize, but only talking about the podcast, you know? And I'm like, it's kind of cool. <laughs> you know, it's kind of cool to get recognized or at least, uh, you know, get some some positivity out of something like other than being a musician, which is cool. Um, and then now. even further than that, the podcast has now done two Star Wars themed emo nights that we call Mosh oh Eisley. God. And that's Wait, been what, amazing. What? Yeah, yeah. Star it's, Wars theme emo yeah, night? Yeah, yeah. People doing, dress Nick? up. What do you do? <laughs> People dress up. They bring their lightsabers. It's amazing. It's a lot of fun. We did one at the first one ever was at Chain Reaction. Um, oh, as yeah. it should be. As yeah, it yeah. should be. Exactly. Who's, who's your favorite Star Wars character? Uh, at this point, I feel like my appreciation mostly lies with, with Leia. I like her perseverance oh. and what she stood for. Growing up, Luke Skywalker, the hero with the lightsaber, of course, you of know. Of course. But the more they've developed a lot of the characters and, and all this stuff, I'm like, yeah, Leia's kind of, she's the one for sure. Yeah, right. Where, where do you sit with Jar Jar? He's, he's literally, let me, let me see if I can move my oh, camera. Oh, no, you got quick. Jar Jar on deck right there now? There he is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, you know, it's more, uh, it's not necessarily, I wouldn't say it's like an ironic joy but it's more of like a, a a little bit more of a comeback story i feel like that whole generation of like those prequel kids are all adults now and everyone's like we kind of gave him a hard time yeah yeah <laughs> I, I, when he when he first came out he got annihilated yeah, that's yeah. for sure <laughs> that's for sure if you had the opportunity to like join some sort of like elite space fighting force would yeah. you do it yeah of course yeah yeah. Sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would, what else? I got nothing else to do right now. <laughs> I'll do it in between tours. <laughs> nice, man. Awesome, yeah. Nick. Well, uh, a couple more questions for you, man. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, I really appreciate your time being on of the course. podcast, bro. It's been great talking to you. Um, what are some things that inspire you creatively? Um, well, I mentioned community, you know, like that's, that's yeah. a big, that's a big thing for sure. You know, during the pandemic, I tried to get a little bit more into like, like, uh, I don't know. I don't want to say graphic arts because there's actual artists out there who do things like that. But I do respond a lot to like just design and stuff like that. Like Chris, the drummer of our band and myself have a coffee roasting company too called Legal Speed. And we're, yeah, we're, we're in the middle of uh, like kind of rebranding that now. We It had to take like 
kind of we put it on the back burner for the last couple of months because we were touring and recording and all this stuff and we were just in and out of of uh work for a while but we're we're kind of getting into like a rebrand and a relaunch of that but was that I, a lag wagon reference it is for speed? sure yeah yeah, yeah. absolutely <laughs> um but uh yeah i don't know like creatively uh, you know i love being in a band but i'm always more into like the aesthetic of things so i'm really excited yeah. like like i said with like rebranding legal speed right now and um you know, working on some graphics with other artists for uh, for Bayside stuff because I just think it's all it's all a part of the pie. You know, like music yeah. is is a big obviously the reason why the pie exists, but then everything else around it matters. What we call things, how they look. Um, you know, we're a big band a, a, a band that people get tattooed a lot. So whether it's our logo yeah. or inspired by lyrics or anything like that, it's that's kind of more where I gravitate towards. It's, it's the, it's like the artistic side of selling things. I'm like, I want these things to matter. If people are spending their money on it. I want them to matter. So, um, the, you know, the aesthetic of things is, is, uh, kind of what, 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 what gets me going for sure. Yeah. The details, man, the artistic yeah. details, it's really cool to dive into those, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's, it's nice to make that a part of the process. You yeah. know, I, I can't really imagine, um, you know, like you're talking about control earlier, it, mm -hmm. it, it's it's really hard to like hand off, you know, hand off details like that to other people or, or just in general. You know, yeah. I think one of the cool things about uh, punk rock and just, you know, being an independent band is, is you know, knowing how to do all that shit, yeah, you know, yeah. caring, caring about all that mm -hmm. shit, you know, and being able to knock it out as a band or as a community, like you're saying, mm -hmm. if you have friends who are artists or whatever that you can lean on, that's always a really cool thing, man. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, right on, dude. Uh, you mentioned legal speed rebranding, yeah. the coffee thing. I was going to ask you about that. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Um, let's see what, um, you know, going forward, you guys got the tour coming out mm -hmm. next year, February. People can go online, get tickets for that, right? Yep. Just Bayside.com. Uh, Bayside, Bayside.com. Nice. <laughs> Ooh, double Bayside. Yep. You got any Bayside tats? You got, you got any uh, band tats? Just, what just you got? the logo. Where is it? Yeah, just the logo <laughs> kind of up in my armpit there. Nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we all got uh, these L.A. Bronx tats. Oh, hell yeah. Really I do have mad. also an hourglass. Our fifth record was called Killing Time, and... Uh, that was, you know, we've had a lot of turning points in our career. That was the 2011. Yeah. That record came out, and like making that record was uh, a lot of fun. We did it with Gil Norton, who was, you know, cool. is one of the best producer. Did uh, Jimmy World, did the Pixies, you know, like the like, real important time in our lives to do that record. So I'd, I'd get an hourglass uh, tattoo. So I guess technically that I have two Bayside tattoos. Nice man, nice. All right, Nick. Last question here. Yeah. Uh, I kind of ask it of everybody here. So. Uh, what to you is the meaning of life? Oh, I guess like searching for happiness, you know, it's, it's so, I don't know that you could ever be fully happy, but you get those moments here and there and that's it. You know, you get, you get those moments. And as long as you're able to like, almost like have that reflection of when you're happy to be like inside, just be like, I'm happy right now. Like, remember this, you know, like that's, that's, that's what you, that's for sure what I search for in everyday life right now. Like I, I, being living out here alone being single no i'm not married no kids no nothing i get to spend my money on myself <laughs> and my money ain't more has to do with experiences and, and having fun yeah. right now and, and just having that reflection of like it's it is a process to look for that happiness and find joy so i think that's it i think it's enjoying yeah, and enjoying life is the meaning of life i feel like absolutely brother it's been awesome to talk to you nick i appreciate yeah. your time yeah, my man thank you, Matt. Oh yeah, that's a wrap on episode 51 of the Sailor Jerry podcast. As always, huge amounts of respect and gratitude to our guest, the one and only Nick Gambarian from Bayside. Nick, thank you very much for your time, my man. Really appreciate your energy. Uh, Nick and I have been running around in similar circles for a while now, so it was really cool to finally get to touch base on a real level and talk about music and life. You can follow Nick at Nick Bayside on Instagram. Of course, follow the band Bayside. You can follow me at 213 Matman. Of course, follow Sailor Jerry at Sailor Jerry. And last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, please do not forget that Sailor Jerry Spice Drum is still made the old school way, 92 proof, bold and smooth as hell. Get a bottle, 
put it under the tree, make somebody's holiday. We'll see you guys in two weeks. Peace.